Howdy folks, this is Big Sam. Today, we're talking about counterboring. So we're going to be taking a look first at what that means, and then we're going to be taking a look at some rifles, and I'll show you how to figure out if a rifle that you're looking at is counterboard or if it has not been counterboard. So this term gets thrown around a lot, but what does it actually mean? So counterboard is a really simple term. All it means is you take, you got your muzzle, you get some device that can essentially drill down into the muzzle to widen the diameter of the muzzle. Okay, now you might be saying, well, Big Sam, if you do that, you're going to yeet the rifling at the muzzle. Yes, that is the point of counterboring. So there's a couple reasons why you would want a counterbore rifle. One is a, kind of obviously at this point, a worn muzzle, right? So let's say um, you, the, the muzzle has been like sh just really worn from shooting it a bunch, or honestly, maybe not even that. Maybe it was just uh, abused, and maybe this got dropped against a rock a hundred times, and... The muzzle all got jacked up and the rifling at the very end of the muzzle is a little bit messed up. Well, that's going to be a problem because the very last thing your bullet contacts before it leaves the rifle ing is extremely important. If it's a little messed up at the end, it can really off canter that bullet and really impact your accuracy. So that's one of the uh, theories behind counterboring and why you would want to do it if you have a worn muzzle. But there's other reasons you would uh, want to counterbore too. Now, I've seen Mosins where it literally, like, the first three or four inches of the muzzle look like they were stored under the ocean, okay? Just horrible pitting, both on the outside of the barrel, but also on the inside in the rifling. <laughs> there really wasn't much left there, let's be honest. So if that happens, one of the things you can do uh, is just cut down the barrel, essentially, right? So then you might maybe pass this point down here, you still have good rifling left in the barrel. So you could just chop the barrel. But if we're in, uh, depending on the scenario in a military context and really what technologies we have, we may not have a good way to reattach that front sight there, right? So if I chop the barrel here, well, now I, I have yeeted the front sight off of the rifle. That's kind of a problem. So, I mean, maybe you could have a way to, like, braze it back on, but that's pretty horrible. Uh, you know, recutting, like, a new dovetail for this would not really be that much fun, let's be honest. So what you can do instead is just drill down into the barrel, widen the diameter till you get to good rifling again, and then you're home free. Because when you do that, at this whole point now that had a lot of pitting, it's guaranteed now that the bullet is not actually going to come into contact with any of that surface, because it's going to be wider than the diameter of the bullet significantly. So hopefully that makes sense, but that's another one of the theories behind counterboring is you can you can get rid of that bad material, and you don't have to... You don't have to um, remove or chop the barrel and you get to retain the cool classic look of the Mosin and you get to keep your front sight. You can still see to hit the target, which is kind of important. Okay, so that's essentially what counterboring is. Now I get a lot of questions about counterboring and well one of the most common questions that Big Sam gets about counterboring is Big Sam is my rifle counterboard. So now I'm gonna take you through some easy steps to tell if a rifle's been counterboard. And we're going to approach this from a scenario maybe like just like you would be in at, say, a gun shop or a gun store. We just have these three Mosins propped up against a table here. So we're going to go through and look at each one of these and figure out if these guys are counterboard or not. Uh, now, I'm going to use a cheater device to do this, but if you look at Mosins, if you look at Mosins enough, you can tell instantly like that if the rifle has a brand new muzzle, a ward muzzle, or if it's counterboard. It's actually really easy. 
you just got to kind of get used to looking at what the differences are and kind of get a picture in your mind of what each one is. Because let's face it, I'm a visual learner, so I have to actually see what each one looks like. So that's what we're going to do here. So my cheater device that I mentioned is this, a Tula 148 grain full metal jacket, steel case, 762 by 54 rimmed per, uh, bullet. So I guess you'd say cartridge. So we're going to take this guy, we're going to approach our first rifle. Now, we don't know if this weapon is clear or not. We always have to assume a weapon is loaded, cocked, and locked. So what we don't want to do, first off, is basically stick your head right over the muzzle uh, because it could well be the end of you. So let's not do that. We need to treat these that they're as what they are, dangerous weapons. Okay, so without sticking my head over the muzzle, uh, what you can do is just set the bullet on the muzzle like that. See that? See how see how the bullet sunk all the way down there? Try and get my camera to focus a little bit better. Um, but you can see how it sunk all the way down to the neck. If it sinks all the way down to the neck of the cartridge, all the way to here, then it's absolutely 100% counterboard, okay? So to show you the differences, let me do that one more time. See that? Sinks all the way down to the neck of the case. Now if we take a closer look at the actual muzzle of the gun here, all right, we can see that it's the muzzle, if I can get my camera to focus again, I think my camera has ADHD. It doesn't really like to focus. Okay, so there we go. Okay, we can see that we don't actually see any rifling here and the uh, the muzzle looks very wide. The diameter here at the muzzle looks very wide, a lot wider than a, well, 30 caliber. And that makes a lot of sense because we can see it is wider because it sinks all the way down to the neck of the case. This whole section right here where my thumb is, that shouldn't, see, this is actually wider than the diameter of the bullet. This should really not sink normally if your muzzle has not been counterboard. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at our next rifle. So our first rifle here, this is a 9130 rifle, and we can already tell that it's been counterboard. Let's look at our next one. And this one's interesting, it has a sniper bolt. All right, I'm not gonna stick my head over the muzzle again. Now this one looks really different, okay? So you can actually see here, you can actually see the rifling. It's almost brand new, this gun. But you can see this has like a really well-defined crown and it has rifling, whereas on this guy, no. Nah. So you can kind of see, if we can put it side by side here, uh, it, it's, it's very different. It's like night and day between these two guys. Huge counterboard muzzle original non-counterboard muzzle. And just to show you, I'll put my cartridge in here. See that? It only sinks to there. So that tells us that in fact, oh yeah, this has definitely not been counterboard. It's pretty simple. Okay, now what about these rifles? What are they exactly? Well, before we get to number three, because we'll get to that here in a little bit, uh, our first rifle here is actually a standard refurbished 9130 rifle, but there's a little bit of a twist to it. So if we look at the barrel markings here, we can see that this guy was actually produced in 1895. So this rascal is, oh man, 127 years old. And generally when you see a 9130 like this, you think World War II, except some of them can actually be quite a bit older, older Dragoon models or Cossack models that were retrofitted post-war with a sight base from a 9130. And that's what we have here. Now, this guy, we can see he's got a lot of pitting. He's definitely seen better days, but I'm glad that the Soviets still looked at this and said, you know what, we're still gonna make use of this gun because they easily could have just yeeted this gun. But the fact that they kept it around is a really cool reminder of history, because this thing went through a lot, right? The Russo-Japanese War, 
um, World War One, World War Two. Who knows what other conflicts? But at least the, I mean, just 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 a fascinating piece of history here. But what we can obviously tell from before, this rascal has been counterboard big time, folks. Uh, and that kind of makes sense, right? Because you think about it, the older a rifle is, uh, the older a Mosin is, the more likely it is to be counterboard. Because, well, it's just been used a lot or misused a lot. Now, a lot of times, even, um, the muzzles can, on these guys can be worn out from improper cleaning tactics. You can use a steel cleaning rod and push it down the muzzle end a whole bunch of times, like hundreds or thousands of times, and that's going to end up wearing out the muzzle slowly over time as well. So all those factors come into play. It's very unsurprising that this rifle is counterboard. Now, how much is a rifle counterboard typically? Well, that's a good question, and that can also depend. Now, this particular one I've measured and he comes in at being counterboard to four and a half centimeters. So that down here somewhere. Right around, I guess, where the rear sight is. So all oh, this whole area on this guy, there's no rifling at all. Now that's interesting, that number four and a half centimeters, because the main artillery directorate of the Soviet Union uh, in World War II, they dictated that a rifle could not be counterboard more than four and a half centimeters. So even though we, we say that counterboring is kind of, I guess some people would describe it as kind of ghetto, and there, yeah, it, it is, but you know what? It's it's a part of Mosins, and so many Mosins are counterboard that uh, within the Mosin community, uh, it doesn't really matter as much as it does to you know people who aren't really familiar with Mosins. I personally think counterboring is kind of cool because it gives you a better indication that the rifle was really heavily used. And that's important because these rifles are all about history. Okay? If you, there are certain guns where you don't want, you know, a really worn out rifle. You want the nicest one. With Mosins, that's not always the case. Um, again, if the, since the history is such a big charm factor of these rifles, having one that's counterboard is actually kind of cool. Because it, it's much more likely that your rifle, if yours is, was counterboard, was used or used heavily in forward combat roles. Not to say it wasn't used in those sorts of roles if it hasn't been counterboard. It's just, again, it's another box to tick. Okay, so counterboarding is kind of interesting, but uh, what happens if a rifle needed to be counterboard more than four and a half centimeters? Uh, let's say during World War II. Well, I think it depends. I think generally what would have happened was the um, the uh, the army, the military, the Soviet Union would basically just have uh, removed the barrel and replaced the barrel on something like this rifle, okay? So that's generally what would have happened. However, there are some really interesting cases where 9130 rifles potentially could actually have been shortened and converted into M38 carbines or M44 carbines. It, it is documented that this was allowed, at least at some level, but I haven't really seen too many guns that I can actually confirm that that occurred on, but it is interesting to talk about. Okay, now another thing we want to get to is sniper rifles. So... As you might have seen, this guy is a sniper rifle. So let's take a closer look at this guy. Uh, this particular rifle is actually a P an original PU sniper produced by the Ijevs factory in 1944. We can see our original serial number for the scope that was on this rifle. We can see there's no more scope. This rifle is actually one of the Samco snipers imported from Yugoslavia, and this was given to them as war aid by the Soviets around probably late of 1944, sometime. Now, sniper rifles are interesting because the Soviet Union absolutely 100% prohibited the counterboring of sniper rifles. Now, this one hasn't even been used as we saw earlier. Basically, it's like almost brand new. 
really well-defined crown, just really nice looking gun overall. Pretty much brand spanking new, baby. Okay, but uh, what happens if you have a snipe rifle that needs to be counterboard, right? The Soviet Union prohibited it. Um, what would have happened was, and we've seen this on some guns, but probably what would have happened was it would have been removed from a sniper roll. Okay, but the gun wouldn't have been, like, destroyed because there exists a thing called the X-Sniper, which you may have heard of. And there are some X-Snipers I've seen where they are counterboard. Now, if you have a counterboard X-Sniper, i.e. a sniper rifle that was then had the holes filled in and then just converted back into a standard infantry rifle, like our first rifle here, if you had something like that... What would have happened was um, you would have a sniper rifle that was then converted into an X sniper rifle. Okay, and then it would have been counterboard. Okay, but what we what we can infer from that is the counterboring definitely occurred uh, after the rifle was no longer a sniper rifle anymore. So if you have a sniper rifle that's been counterboard. Uh, one, either it's just, it's a fake, and it's already sort of likely because most Mosin sniper rifles you come across are a fake, but it could be a fake, or, or it could be an original sniper rifle, like this guy here, that was extremely worn, and then it was counterboard, converted back into an infantry rifle, a 9130 rifle like our first rifle here, and then... Once all of that was happened, right? So we so go back again. We have a counterboard, and we have an X sniper gun now. So we take all that together, and what that gives us is an original sniper rifle that was counterboard, and you can kind of see where I'm going with this. Okay, so it's possible then that that original sniper rifle is converted and then to an X sniper, and then counterboard. Somebody then decided to convert that back into an original sniper rifle. It's very common with these X snipers to see them uh, un X sniper fied. I don't know, however, however you want to define your terms, but take the X sniper, put a scope back on it essentially, i.e., put it back to its original form. That's another possibility if you have an X sniper or a sniper rifle. A Mosin with a scope that has been counterboard. Okay, so now that we have all of that out of the way, we have a much better understanding of counterboard and versus non counterboard rifles among the Soviet Union. But I know a lot of y'all are probably asking yourselves right about now Big Sam, two questions. One, what about the third rifle? Two, what about Finland? Because didn't Finland use a lot of Mosins, and didn't they counterboard Mosins? Well, guess what? It's your lucky day, because we're going to knock out both of those questions with one stone, or in this case, one Mosin. Let's take a look at our third rifle here. So here, to move on this side, we can actually see that this rifle is counterboard as well. See that? There's... There's no rifling, there's no muzzle crown, there's no nothing there, folks. In fact, you can actually see, and it's kind of hard to see, you can actually see some of the chattering left on the inside of the muzzle from the tool they used to counterbore the rifle. So that's pretty cool, but what is this exactly? Well, if I set this guy down here for a second, pick this up. You've probably seen this rifle before if you've watched our channel. This is, of course, our 1894 Chateau Mosin, produced in France. And, of course, reused by Finland, as we can see our SA in a box stamping here. This rifle, folks, has been places. Oh boy, has it been places. Now, Finland, of course, had to use basically what they had. They didn't have much of a military to speak of in... Well, the 1920s, as they uh, had after they become an independent nation after uh, defeating the the Reds in the Finnish Civil War, 
But what they had was a lot of Mosins. They decided to standardize on the Mosin. So, and that one worked out pretty well for them because there was a lot of Mosins in Europe that a lot of people kind of wanted to get rid of in favor of generally the Mauser, or in some cases the Japanese Arisaka rifle, but generally the Mauser in 8mm became a pretty popular cartridge across most of Europe and in the Balkan region in the 1920s and on into the 1930s. Although the Mosin was still around there, Finland really tried to buy them all up or horse trade with what they had for Mosins. So they ended up getting Mosins from all sorts of areas across the world and in all sorts of weird conditions. We can already tell this one here has some really horrible pitting, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. If I took the stock off on this one, you'd see... <laughs> you'd see it gets a lot worse. So this one is not in the greatest of condition, uh, but it still works. Now, the muzzle, as you saw, was also counterboard. Now, who counterboard this rifle? Eh, it's actually kind of hard to say for certain who counterboard this rifle. It's possible the Russians counterboard it, or in World War I. It's possible that somebody else counterboard it in World War I. We don't really know. Uh, the chances are, though, because this whole gun's been refinished uh, by Finland. Uh, remember, we, we just had a video on refinishing. This one has got all sorts of bluing still uh, down in here, although there's not a lot in the bolt channel left. This rifle has definitely been uh, re-blued as far as I can tell. Um... That's what, that's kind of what it appears to me. Again, some of these, it's actually kind of hard to tell or not, but I think this one has been reblued. So, because of all of that, I actually think Finland probably counterboard this rifle. Uh, I mean, let's face it, look how horrible this gun looks. I think a lot of countries might have just scrapped a gun like this, which is kind of depressing because, one, there's a lot of history here, but two, it, I mean, as Finland has showed us in this gun, it's still perfectly uh, adequate for and gun in a pinch. And in a pinch they were in come 1939 with the Winter War. And of course later with the Continuation War and the Lapland War. So they didn't have a lot of money and a lot of the guns they had were in good condition, but probably more so a lot of the guns they had were in not that great condition in at least one area or another. Maybe the stock was jacked up or there was just a lot of issues with the rifling, especially at the muzzle. Whatever the case, Finland had tons and tons of counterboard Mosins, just like this one. And not just M91s either. Uh, we know absolutely Finland counterboard rifles, right? It's not certain they counterboard this rifle, but we know they counterboard rifles because we see things like uh, M27s, and M28 rifles that are obviously Finnish-made guns that are counterboard. So it's pretty obvious to me that they did, in fact, counterboard a lot of rifles. So probably the majority of the counterboard rifles they had, they were the ones that counterboard them, would be my guess. But again, that's just a guess for now, until I have more solid research to go on. Okay, so remember earlier we talked about how the counterboard rifles were only counterboard up to four and a half centimeters by the Soviets in World War II. Well, in this time, it, Finland might not have done what you would have thought, because when we think of Finnish Mosins, a lot of people think of them as being higher quality, which is a term I don't really like. But uh, it's actually very wrong in many cases, especially this one, because... Well, Finland actually, if you look at their Mosins they made, they cared a lot more about quality than the Soviets did, but they had to balance that with just being able to supply their army with arms. So you, you end up with a weird scenario like this rifle demonstrates where the Finland had a lot of really nice brand new guns essentially, but they also had a lot of guns like this where they were so counterboard, the Soviets would have looked at it and said, no, this is, this is not good, this is far too counterboard, we can't use this barrel, it needs to be replaced. 
That's pretty much what they would have said to this. Uh, in fact, they probably would have just reused this receiver and built a 9130 off of this receiver if they actually got a hold of this rifle. So I'm glad they didn't, and I'm glad we still have this cool rifle in its mostly original state, uh, preserved for future generations. So that's cool. There's our finished renumbered site, uh, site base here on the right in meters, but... Uh, this one is, I think I measured this one and it's counterboard like over, I want to say like six centimeters. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty impressive how counterboard this rifle is. So again, Finland used, well, they worked with what they had and this <laughs> rifle is what they had. And well, they worked with it as we can see here. All right. So now how do you measure how counterboard a rifle is? Well, uh, the, the way I would recommend doing it is the same method I recommend for uh, cleaning Mosins. You want to get a carbon fiber cleaning rod, okay? Not a steel one. <laughs> Not this cleaning rod. This cleaning rod right here on these Mosins, these are for show. Uh, I do not ever recommend using these for cleaning. Uh, you can, but, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make a habit out of it. If you, if you, like, if you shot corrosive ammo... And you're in a pinch and you just need to clean out the uh, the corrosive salts or something. Yeah, that's fine, but I wouldn't make a habit of it. Instead, use a carbon fiber rod, uh, both for cleaning and for checking the counterboardness of your rifle. Uh, carbon fiber rods are great because they're not that expensive. They're a lot cheaper than a rifle is, folks. And it's not going to damage your gun at all. So what you do is, again, don't stick your head directly over the gun, but you're going to get a, a rod and stick it down the muzzle. And you're kind of going to drag it along one side of the muzzle, or inside the rifling, excuse me, and push it down until you can kind of feel it reach rifling. Now, sometimes there will be a basically a step where it immediately goes from no rifling, large diameter, to smaller diameter rifling so that step and you'll feel that now some of these though are a lot more gradual right a lot more gradual shaped on the inside so you kind of have to just feel around a little bit again it, it, you gotta get used to it but you can get used to it and just stick it down until you feel rifling and then keep your finger there then pull it out and then you measure that length and that's how counterboard your gun is um now a lot of people have more questions about counterboard, and we're not going to get to them all today, but another one that comes up is, uh, you know, does it make my rifle worth less, or is my rifle not desirable, or is it less desirable because it's counterboard? Uh, generally, no, okay? Remember I said earlier, Mosins are weird, and people that like Mosins, in this community, we kind of all understand that a lot of Mosins are counterboard, that's the way they are, so... If your rifle's counterboard, generally it won't hurt the value that much. Now, if you're shopping for one, um, if you can get a really good deal, if it's counterboard, who cares, right? If it's pretty high up on the spectrum of Mosin prices and it's counterboard, you might want to just keep waiting because if that's something you really care about, you could probably pretty easily find another Mosin that's not counterboard for the same price. Again, it's kind of personal preference, and maybe you're interested in more of the history, and you want to go with a counterboard gun, well, that's that's fine too. Um, but just my two cents. Now, Finnish Mosins, again, are really weird. A lot of these rifles are counterboard. So if your rifle like this, like this French Mosin, is counterboard, uh, nobody really cares all that much because French Mosins in general, are pretty scarce, so if you find one, they're almost always counterboard. So it doesn't really hurt the price because the large majority are counterboard. But if you find a French Mosin like this that's not counterboard, uh, that's actually going to make it worth an even higher premium because that's very uncommon. Most of these guns are counterboard. Um, so it... it yeah, it depends on how you look at it, but if am I worried about it if a gun's counterboard? No, I don't I don't really care that much. I mean, if you're going for like an accuracy build and maybe you want to sporterize your Mosin, 
uh, you know, maybe you even, who cares? Because maybe you just want to cut the barrel anyway. But so generally speaking, if it's counterboard, don't worry about it. It's not that big of a deal. Um, now, there's a lot of people that say, oh, it's terrible. It's like disfiguring your rifle. And mm. I mean, there's some validity to that, but it's also like historical. That's just, that's what was done to these rifles. I mean, and these are generally the people that say that. I were going to call them uh, Mauser snobs, right? The people that generally like a lot nicer, higher quality, high-end guns than Mosins, right? These things are rough and ratty and uh, very very blue-collar guns, right? Some of the nicer guns, the Swiss guns and the German guns and the Czech rifles, right? They're a lot nicer, and I can understand why a lot of people that are used to that kind of gun don't want their gun to be counterboard. I mean, this again, this is something totally different. When we're on this channel, when we're talking about Mosins, we're in a totally different world, folks. We're in a historical setting. And folks, we like our Mosins. So, I hope you all learned a little bit more about counterboring today. I hope you all found this informative and useful. If you have questions, feel free to email me anytime. I always put my email in the description of every video, so go check that out. Uh, if you all haven't already, please consider subscribing. We do all sorts of cool Mosin Nagant content just like this here on the channel. Let me know if y'all got any prayer requests, and we'll see you next time.